So for this lecture, which is your chronic respiratory, you're going to need the packet that says asthma. And to some extent, you'll need to understand that a lot of what I'm talking about will be in your procedures packet as well. Uh, the page you want to turn to in your procedures packet is page six because any kind of um, respiratory conditions and procedures will be on pages six and seven in your procedures packet. Now we start with our asthma packet and we start immediately talking about the first page. So as long as you have your, um, your chronic respiratory packet out, you should be fine. Let me just say before I get too far gone that you have another respiratory packet but this one is actually your acute respiratory, just in case you wanted to know, well, what's the difference, right? And of course, asthma is in both of those packets because with an acute respiratory system um, packet that you have, if the patient comes in in full-blown asthma, of course, we, it's an acute situation. They're gonna die if you don't help them. But the chronic aspect of asthma it comes into play as to how to prevent the asthma attack in the first place, how to monitor that an asthma attack is coming. And so the very first part of this lecture is going to be indeed asthma. Now, so with asthma, you can see in your handout there's something that says triggers. And there are a ton of triggers. Certainly I want you to highlight some more than others. Next to the word trigger itself, the word itself, I want you to write smoke. Because smoke, any way you bring it, is a huge trigger. Um, it doesn't have to be smoking the cigarettes, it doesn't have to be smoking the marijuana, you know how folks say, well, you know, Reefa is so much more natural and less, um, you know, cancer causing, it's all bullshit, because it's all smoke. So the smoke from a cigarette is no different from the smoke from marijuana. And the funny thing about it is they always say, well, it grows, you know, it's a plant, it grows. Well, so is tobacco. It's a plant, it grows, okay? It doesn't matter. They're both extremely damaging to the asthmatic patient. And if you have children with asthma, then smoking in the home is killing them slowly. It is decreasing their immune system. It is causing them to be at very high risk for strep throat, uh, pink eye, um, pneumonia, flu, um, all of the horrible things that kids should never have to put up with every other month. And so we know that smoke in and of itself is an allergen. Now it doesn't just mean smoking, because some people get caught up in smoking. No, you may not even smoke, and you may have caused children to have an asthma attack if you have the fireplace on. And so here you are with this beautiful fireplace and smoke and everything else, that can cause uh, um, an asthma attack, especially if children are near there where you're getting the fire started. Uh, I remember my cousin who has really bad asthma coming outside, I'm out there cooking my ribs. She wanna tell me how to cook the ribs. She lift up the grill top, smoke hit her in the face. Instead of cooking ribs, we in Hillcrest Emergency Room playing with her and his asthma attack. So any kind of smoke will do it. Maybe it's the fact that your patient's address is in the flats and you have all these factories and these refineries and smoke and everything else. Maybe the patient works at LTV Steel. Maybe the patient works at B&M Ribs. I mean, anywhere there's smoke. So smoke in and of itself is a huge trigger. On this handout as well, if you keep on going, you'll see exercise. It's very important that you highlight exercise and the one above it, which is URI. This is an upper respiratory infection. Upper respiratory infection is nothing more than a cold. A kid could have a cold and all of a sudden it becomes asthma. With regards to exercise, um, I ran track, so kids who think about things like basketball or track or tennis or any of those where you're like really working hard, they would need to use a um, inhaler, a butyrol inhaler, and really write this down 30 minutes before that activity. Maybe it's as simple as gym class, I don't know, you know, volleyball, whatever. They would need to use that inhaler 30 minutes before that actual activity. That's how you deal with exercise induced asthma. If you keep looking at this list, you'll see something that says GERD. Underneath that, I want you to add a bullet point and put pets. Uh, you may remember the uh, Obamas when they were in office looking for the type of pet that would not 
trigger asthma or allergies in the girls. I have the same problem in our house. My grandson has severe asthma, and while he doesn't live with me, I have him enough where I can't have a dog with long hair. Uh, those long haired dogs, your Rottweilers, your German Shepherds, your Dobermans, whatever, uh, they may trigger more allergies and asthma than the um, shorter haired dogs like the little Bichons or the Poodles or the Terriers. And so you're, um, you may have that on a test where you have to understand what type of dog would be recommended for the patient. Cats are usually, usually a no-no, okay? They're just a lot of hyperallergies, hyperallergenic cats. Um, you have a lot of allergies with the cats, okay? So understand that. Um, sometimes you may not understand it because we don't automatically look at addresses of our patients, but if you did, and if you certainly did an, um, um, an informal study, uh, in the Cleveland area, maybe you go to Rainbow Babies and Children and you look at all the kids that have asthma, there would be certain many of those children that, learn, li that live in the same exact zip code. Um, and that is because we know that cockroaches are a very high uh, trigger for asthma. And if you know anything about subsidized housing um, by the government, they're called projects. I lived in them before, so I know for sure that these roaches are like they're just like your neighbors. They don't run when the lights are on or anything else. They're like, hey, what are we eating today? You know, kind of thing. So your baby, your child, your kid may be back and forth to rainbow babies and children with this asthma attack for no other reason than their zip code, okay? So they're all coming from the same housing complex, if you will. And there's many of them. There's, um, there's so many housing complexes in the inner city that it's ridiculous, okay? So that could be why this child has asthma. The adult or the child with GERD, uh, gastrointestinal reflux disorder, which is the last one before you wrote pets in, this is where the patient has quote unquote heartburn or reflux disorder, and it can trigger them to coughing, and that coughing can just lean right on into asthma. So that's another thing to remember. Now we know when we look at asthma, we have to distinguish asthma from COPD. So asthma is considered a reversible airway obstruction. COPD is an irreversible airway obstruction, but they are both airway obstructions. The other thing about asthma is that you wanna remember for asthma on this handout, if you look under the title, it says reactive airway disease. This is just another name for asthma. And you know, if you're not careful, they'll use that terminology and you'll go, what, what is that? And it's reactive airway disease. It's kind of like what we called it before we labeled somebody with asthma. Um, you may remember the days of pre-existing conditions. This was a big thing in the election. Um, pre-existing conditions meant that you had something that once you put it on paper, you couldn't get insurance, and that's how asthma used to be treated. So we would kind of get around it and write really colorful language like reactive airway disease and hope that that kind of, you know, kind of avoided not being able to get insurance. Now, I want you to do two things for this particular uh, handout that you're writing on. I need you to write the word black and write it long ways. I wrote mine on the paper at the top, above the triggers. I just wrote the word black vertically. This is another um, huge sign that the patient may be either an asthmatic or at the very least at risk for anaphylactic shock or have some allergies that we need to worry about. And I'll explain why allergies and asthma go together in a minute, but let's just work it, okay? So the B is for bananas. If a patient is allergic to bananas, they are at risk for anaphylactic shock and more often than not, they may even have asthma, okay? Uh, then we see the letter L. This is latex. Patients who are allergic to latex very often have asthma or some other allergic condition, eczema, something like that, okay? A is avocados. On your test, maybe they try to be funny, and instead of saying avocados, they say guacamole, same thing. So 
if a patient is allergic to avocados, guacamole, whatever, then that patient probably has asthma, eczema, or allergies. Uh, so this is another substance that goes with that, okay? Let's try another one. The C is for chestnuts. Chestnuts or let's just say any nuts, especially tree nuts. This is a big one. Certainly it's my grandson. He has asthma, he has eczema, he's allergic to nuts. Okay, so it's like, oh boy, here we go. The whole thing with the whole thing called black. Okay, this is the mnemonic I use for the kinds of substances or foods that if this person has an allergy to it, you better beware, okay? Uh, the K is for kiwi, and you may not understand it, but kiwi is a type of citrus fruit. So the citrus fruits are all in the same category. Uh, allergy to oranges, lemons, kiwi, strawberries, they're all in the same group. Um, most people don't know that, so that's another one to kind of know. Now, there's one more thing that this mnemonic of black goes with and it is called and you can see here as my black triad you can see that there's one more thing for us to cover so i'm going to erase this and then i'm going to put the triad up and hope that you can fit that at the bottom of the page i certainly made my triangle or triad at the bottom okay you have lots of room so you can put that at the bottom. Let me go ahead and make that for you. This, every time on your test, if you see the word triad, it means triangle. And so this is called the allergic triad. Okay, it's called the allergic triad. And the allergic triad is basically the three conditions that if you have one, you probably have the other two, or at the very least, you probably have the other one. So let's go ahead and look at what that looks like. The lecture title is asthma. So we'll put asthma here. If you have asthma, you probably have eczema. If you have eczema, maybe you have allergies. And allergies can be to food or substances. This allergic triad, if you show up at my ER with any of these things, if I draw your blood, I will see an elevated IgE. And I have a trick for you that I tell you to remember. This IgE, I want you to remember E for EpiPen because people who are allergic to certain substances, mostly the black mnemonic I showed you, or have asthma, or have eczema, have a high IgE, and should carry an EpiPen if this is their deal, okay? And so you remember that with regards to um, the EpiPen, we said if you are carrying an EpiPen, for your protection, you probably don't qualify for the COVID vaccine because it has been shown to cause anaphylactic reactions. Well, if you have anything going on with this triangle, and it's not one of them, you have to have two. You need two for us to be worried about you going into anaphylaxis. This patient is at risk for anaphylaxis, okay? Now, my grandson has already had anaphylaxis. He has asthma, he has allergies, he has eczema, he's already had anaphylaxis, he has to be with an EpiPen all the time. We're at the hospital, and it was, uh, in his case, it was Reese's Pieces, peanuts, nuts, that sent him straight to Hoosier. Okay, so this is the type of thing you have to be careful with. Anytime a patient has asthma, you may want to inquire further as to just how bad this might be in their life. Now, I will tell you this, some people, like my grandson, have asthma for no good nor reason other than they have asthma. But we know that this allergic triad is an increased risk anytime you feed babies too early. In other words, if you feed a new baby food, real food, too early, then they can get into trouble. So babies should not eat anything except mom or formula 
until six months. But many people are such in a hurry. They put cereal in the bottle because somebody told them the baby will sleep at night. They go and they start with this um, breakfast cereal at three or four months, shoveling it in their face. And they feed them all these foods at five months. No, they don't need any of that crap. In fact, what happens when you give these babies these food items way before six months? They develop an allergic reaction. They get a rash on their face. It's a very bad rash a lot of times. A bad rash on their face. They develop eczema. And these other two problems, asthma and allergies, just from feeding them too early. The primary candidate is the cereal in the bottle. That is the number one risk. So you have an African-American patient or a Latino patient. This habit is pretty common. And it's based on the misconception that it will help them sleep. I never gave any cereal in a bottle to my children. They both slept through the night after six weeks of life. So they didn't need that. I think what happens is around the time that the mother or grandmother puts this in the bottle is around the time the child would have started sleeping through the night anyway. And they associated the two to be you know, associated and causal when really there's no cause, okay? So just so you know, because if you know better, you do better, you teach better, and I'm trying to teach you to teach better. So that's the deal, all right? Now, with asthma, if you look at this paper, you can see that this baby, this child, this person, has a little bit of the respiratory distress song. You can see the hypoxemia, tachycardiorestasis, and tachypnea. If you go over to the other side of the handout, you know that the asthma attack is gonna start with a cough. And I wanna tell you that sometimes it's so subtle, you don't really notice this cough. And the baby will cough, or even the child will cough. My grandson came home from the hospital with this cough. Like seriously, days into life was coughing. And my dog brought it up. I'm like, oh, I don't think it's anything. I mean, it's just got here, right? It's just a little cough. It's nothing bad. It wasn't horrific. It didn't cause him distress. It was just a stupid cough. And here, this cough turned, it, turned out to be asthma. The cough usually is much worse at night. Remember that. The cough is worse at night. They work themselves up to the point where they're short of breath, their chest is tight, um, there's mucus developing, it just, it gets really bad. But if you look at the page, you'll see it says early that the PACO2, and if you remember, we don't care about the P and the A, we care about the CO2. You'll see in the early asthmatic child that the CO2 is low. So I ask you, is that acidosis or is it alkalosis? Hopefully you said it's alkalosis because remember that CO2 is an acid and if it's high then the patient's in acidosis. If it's low they're in alkalosis. Early asthma is alkalosis and you see late asthma the PaCO2 is very high and now we have what we call acidosis. Now you do need to know that the lung sound for this patient is expiratory wheezing. You can see that on the handout where it says wheezing, but you want to remember specifically expiratory wheezing. This child is going to have expiratory wheezing whenever you listen to lung sounds, and this will be kind of crazy, as you can imagine. Okay? All right. Now, the retractions are when you should get worried. If you think about retractions, you might have seen them, you just may not have known what they were. And on the page itself is a picture of a boy with his muscles pulled in retracting. So one time I was coming home from work. My grandson was at the house. Um, he was sick and um, the, um, the, the poor little sweet thing wasn't eating or drinking. And so I was told to stop at the store, see if I can get something he likes. Maybe he'll eat more. So I stopped at the store, I got a bunch of stuff a baby would like, I get home, I look at this child, because this is what we do for a living, I look at this kiddo and his muscles around his whole neck and his belly are like literally moving. Okay, so those, that's called retractions. Make sure you quote me on this on your handout. Use of accessory muscles to breathe. That's what retractions are. Use of accessory muscles to breathe. We have three problems with this child. We have a child that is having bronchoconstriction or spasms, that's number one. Number two, we have a child who has inflammation, 
or edema and swelling in the airway. That's number two. And number three, we have excessive mucus production. Those are the three issues of the pathophysiology behind the asthmatic child. And, you know, again, if it's an emergency, well, then we've got to head on in. But this lecture is more towards preventing it in the first place. Of course, if you notice on this handout, and the same handout is in your acute respiratory packet, but it says that the symptoms don't respond to usual treatment in 30 minutes, the patient needs to seek medical attention. What the hell is usual treatment, right? What is that? Well, it's hitting the rescue inhaler twice, right? You have to hit it twice and see if this starts to make you feel better. If it doesn't, then we're gonna call 911 and get ourselves to the nearest hospital. Now, there's something at the bottom of your page called status asthmaticus. This is exactly what it says. Your status is you're in asthma. You're having an asthma attack. But think about it longer term. Status asthmaticus means that you're not stopping. Status asthmaticus means you hit the rescue inhaler, nothing happened. You gave the patient a breathing treatment, nothing happened. They have a nebulizer, nothing happened. They are still having an asthma attack. Make sure you know this patient needs a ventilator. This patient needs a ventilator, okay? So those are just a couple little reminders on the emergent care of the asthma patient. And if you turn the page, you have some more things to really look at. And I love this page because it gives you the list of medications that you might see for this patient in terms of trying to control their asthma. I do want you to know you're going to be responsible for this term, beta to agonist. You see what that is, that's albuterol. That is a rescue medication. You have to know that's a rescue medication. You see the steroids. The steroids are the control or maintenance medication. Don't forget that word, maintenance medication. Okay, so if you want to control the asthma, not keep having asthma attacks, that's called a controller or maintenance medication. It's usually a steroid inhaler usually, not always, but usually a steroid inhaler. You see it says inhaled. I will tell you this, you do have to write this down. If you have an exacerbation of COPD or asthma, they may put you on a pill that is very temporary. That's called systemic steroids. These are called inhaled steroids. So an example, because you know with steroids it usually ends in court or zone. So an example of an inhaled steroid is palmacort. So you know that makes sense, court, palmacort, okay. All right, now theophylline. Theophylline is last resort. I want you to take a couple notes on your theophylline. Theophylline is a last resort and by that I mean that we only use it in the ICU or in my case, I delivered babies for 20 years, so my patients who came in with an asthma attack, I would start them on a theophylline drip, okay? So those patients are very carefully monitored because this is a very strong medication. Please write it down that it is toxic at 20 and it's a last resort. And the reason why it's a last resort is because it can cause horrible, deadly dysrhythmias. So we are monitoring this patient, we're checking theophylline levels, but if it's toxic, it can cause the patient to have some pretty deadly dysrhythmias. Obviously, when we say hydration, we mean IV fluids, not PO. We do not feed respiratory distress patients, okay? And the O2 saturation, you always knew that a O2 saturation, which is written so many different ways, let's remind ourselves how many times or how many different ways it's written. So if you say O2 saturation, you can say pulse ox and mean the same thing. You can say O2 sats and mean the same thing. You can say SpO2 and mean the same thing. All of those mean pulse ox and we need that to stay over 90. You already know that a pulse ox less than 90 is a medical emergency. 
this is what guides your, you know, your, um, your practice and what you're going to be doing with this patient, your therapy. Uh, another group of medications, anticholinergic. An example of an anticholinergic is Atrovent. Atrovent is just another example of a medication called anticholinergics. Now, we're going to go over some more medications for asthma. But I gave you some broad categories. We're also going to go over a little bit more information about asthma. So stay tuned.